Hey everyone, Joshua Kirk here with you once again, and now it's time for my annual year-end list for the end of the year. Uh, for this year, it's going to be my top 50 albums of 2021, which overall has been a really good year for music. A lot of albums really surprised me this year as well. Uh, like, And this has also been a very interesting year in how a lot of albums that ended up being some of my favorites of the year uh, really kind of took their time to really sink in with me. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff that really exactly clicked with me right out of the gate, which uh, is really, which is fine considering that only allows music to get better over time and that can be a really rewarding thing, but I definitely uh, in the end, very much found this year to be extremely strong for albums and for songs as well. Uh, so, without further ado, let's get to the list. Starting with the bottom half of the list, which uh, you're just going to see in a little scroll with the album covers and some background music, and then I'll go more in depth about the top half of the list. So, may I present to you the bottom half of the list. That was the bottom half of my top 50 albums of 2021. Now we move to the top half, the top 25 albums of the year, starting with Yola's Stand For Myself, a fantastic record full of country soul bops with great performances and killer songwriting, and also some really good production from Dan Auerbach on this thing. Uh, easily the biggest splash Yola has made so far in terms of the acclaim and also the Grammy nominations that she has recently gotten, and she completely deserves it, as I think this is a fantastic record. Number 24 is Charlie Adams with Bullseye, a record that should be getting more acclaim than it already has, considering this wave of female singer-songwriters in indie are, is certainly getting a lot of acclaim is becoming very popular these days uh, and I just love how simple and honest these songs are and also some of the best choruses of the year as well. Uh, I like how this record manages to be very much a focus on songwriting but also uh, has sort of hook prowess that a lot of other artists in the slane maybe don't have have as much of in their music, but yeah, this is a really good debut, and I can't wait to see where she takes her music from here. Number 23 is Delete Zeke with Frailty. I'm a little surprised this wound up so high on my list, uh, but just the way that he melds like singer-songwriter fare with some hyper-pop and emo and indie rock, I mean, this is a blend of genres that has been done plenty of times especially in the past year or so, but uh, the way Zeke approaches them I think feels really unique to him, uh, and it's a super creative record too, like really cool song structures on there as well. Uh, I definitely would love to hear some improvement in the future because this album I think acts as a really good blueprint for what his career and his evolution might look like going forward. Number 22 is yet another genre-defying record, which is Genesis Owusu's debut album, Smiling With No Teeth, a record that has certainly gotten a lot of hype over on the internet, and I think it completely deserves it, because it's fusions of psychedelia, hip-hop, funk, and punk, I think are done so creatively and so tastefully throughout this album, but there's still incredible songwriting and definitely a lot of charisma, 
as a performer and as an artist on this record as well. Uh, I mean, it is a kind of all over the place record, uh, but it is his debut, so that kind of makes sense. But I definitely am very excited to hear where he goes next. Number 21 is maybe one of the most out there listening experiences I've had this year, which is Lorraine's Fatigue. Really, I don't know how to put this album in words. It's the kind of album that evokes an emotional reaction, not so much through the songwriting, because yes, I think the lyrics could use a little work in the future, but really it's through what she's doing sonically that I think really evokes this sense of catharsis incredibly well. It's R it's kind of R&B, but it also has this kind of avant jazz feel to it, and there's these short sound collage interludes as well. Uh, and not to mention, it does all of this in just under a half an hour, so uh, it is a short record, but still leaves quite an impact, and there's really nothing like it released in 2021, so yes, really good record. Number 20 is Black Country New Road with For the First Time, yet another internet smash this year. Uh, and there's not much I can say that everyone else hasn't already said, but I think this is one of the most adventurous and unique post-punk and art rock albums with some real enigmatic songwriting on it. And I'm very excited for their sophomore record, which apparently they've already released a few singles from and will be out February next year. So I'm very excited about this band right now. Number 19 is Indu Matar with Afrique Big Team. Another record I'm a little surprised made it this high, but the more I think about how uh, exciting the grooves and the energy on this thing are, and also how fantastic and how blistering uh, Indu's, Matar, Indu's guitar playing on it really is, it really does leave an impact, and uh, it's pretty much an all-killer, no-filler kind of record, which... Uh, even even for people like me who aren't particularly well versed in this style of music, uh, there's no denying that this record really is something special, and I think it completely lived up to all the acclaim it's gotten because this is truly a big achievement right here. Number eighteen is Snail Mail with Valentine, uh, a very raw an honest sort of breakup indie rock concept album that really surprised me this year because I wasn't the biggest fan of her debut, but I think this record just shows a lot of promise. I really like how she's expanded her sound as well. Uh, there's little subtleties, there's some funky elements, there's some kind of loungy ballads on this thing too, uh, and it's a pretty short record. It's an easy one to listen to over and over again, and yes, this is a, just a really good, very well made indie rock effort. Number 17 is probably my favorite metal project of the year, which is Unrequited with Beautiful Ghosts. This thing is kind of an underground gem that I only learned about this year, but man, is it an emotional, uh, cath emotionally cathartic roller coaster from start to finish. The way that they blend the beauty and the atmospheric elements with the crunchiness and the heavy riffs and just the real sort of crushing intensity. Uh, the dynamics on this record are just spot on. And yet another record that evokes emotion, not so much through the lyrics, because I genuinely have no idea uh, what the lyrics on this thing are, but uh, with the sonics and all the just beautiful, spellbinding, symphonic elements. Uh, they, they just, they created something truly very special and one that still gives me chills to this day. Um, number 16 is probably my favorite non-experimental post-punk record of the year, which is Shame's Drunk Tank Pink. Uh, this record definitely also surprised me that it made it this high on here because I liked this record when it came out but listening back to certain records as I was sort of compiling this list 
um, I realized that, holy shit, this album is just banger after banger after banger. I love how this album is nothing super complicated or forward-thinking. It's just really good, energetic, passionate, and uh, exciting post-punk with uh, great intricacies and uh, killer performances and some great introspective moments as well. Yeah, this album absolutely kicks ass from front to back. Number 15 is Remy Wolf's debut album, Juno. Certainly one of my favorite new artists I got into this year. Just so colorful, so charismatic and fun of a pop record. And her genre fusions, I think, are really eclectic and very tasteful as well. Uh, fantastic songwriting on here. The chorus is a really good too. It's just bop after bop after bop. And yeah, I definitely uh, am glad that I kind of discovered her out of nowhere this year. Num number 14 is one of the five kick records released by Arca, which includes uh, the album she put out last year and the four records she recently put out at the end of the year, uh, which is crazy. The one I want to focus on here, though, is Kick 3, which I agree with the majority. It's the best in the series. Uh, just the way that she manages to basically obliterate everything you may know about club music or dance music with a record that just dials the intensity of it up to 11, and even the pace is kind of speedy and sort of uh, frenetic as well. Um, and just great production on here, her her rapping performances are insane, the vocal manipulations are insane, uh, it is just a total, like, ball of fire from start to finish, and I absolutely can't help but appreciate it. Number 13 is Wild Pink's A Billion Little Lights, uh, this kind of dreamy, woozy, kind of, uh, Heartland sounding indie rock and Americana record with some of the best songwriting of the year. And I also love how this record manages to be atmospheric, but also still have great attention to detail in terms of the, the little elements, the instrumentation on here. Uh, every time I listen to this record, I discover something new, whether it's in the production or maybe a lyric that would just slay me uh, when I didn't know it. Um, and yeah, just a really good record, and uh, just what a beauty this is. What a beauty this album is. Number 12 is kind of an obvious pick. It is Tyler, the Creator's Call Me If You Get Lost, but come on. Tyler's on a fantastic three-album run right now, and uh, this record kind of throws it back to his odd future days a little bit, but doing it with even more focus and clarity than ever before with uh, some great verses from Tyler, uh, killer production, uh, wonderful writing, awesome features, uh, just a really good uh, rap record, and maybe the first true rap album from Tyler in a little while, and it's great to see him continuing to uh, impress once again. Um, Number 11 is probably the most unsettling album I've listened to this year, uh, and that is Lingua Ignota's Sinner Get Ready, which I, I definitely think this is the best thing Kristen has ever done. I really like how she essentially departs from her noise and industrial roots into a record that takes traditional Appalachian folk music and literally just takes it to this twisted and kind of trippy place. Uh, the lyrics are incredibly disturbing as well. Uh, Kristen shows her wide range uh, in such an impressive way on this thing, and like the vocal layering on this thing is just absolutely insane as well. Over an hour long and never loses my attention. Uh, this is really just an incredible achievement. Not the easiest album to listen to, the one that I recommend uh, all the same. Alright, we're there. The top 10 albums of the year. 
top 10 albums of 2021. Very excited about all these records that made the cut. Starting with number 10, which is Arm & Hammer, joining forces with The Alchemist on Haram. I've always been a fan of Arm & Hammer stuff, but I feel like this record is easily the best thing they have ever done. Just the poetry, the rhymes, the chemistry is even more dense and robust than ever before. And the Alchemist production is the perfect backdrop for the style of music as it's kind of dark and sort of eerie, uh, but also has some really good attention to detail and cool textures as well. Uh, the features are really good, the album flows really well, and it is an album I revisited a lot this year, so it didn't entirely surprise me that it made it into the top 10, because it is just incredible. Number 9 is yet another fantastic underground rap release from the year, which is McKinley Dixon's For My Mama and Anyone Who Looked Like Her. Uh, really one of the most immaculately arranged jazz rap albums of the year, and uh, the lyrics on this thing are so heartfelt and so relatable that I could see even people who don't normally follow hip-hop really getting into this record, because... Uh, uh, it's really good in how it talks about uh, recovering from trauma and really finding your most true self. It is a very moving and kind of inspiring record uh, from him. And I think his rapping and his singing performances are fantastic too. Really like the features. Um, it's kind of dense, long record that clocks in and over uh, 48 minutes, but yet it doesn't feel that way because of just how smooth it goes down. It definitely is an album that really goes down easy with every listen, even no matter how dark the lyrics could get sometimes. And yeah, it is just uh, great to see this being a bit of a cult favorite this year because what McKinley is doing is really something special. Number eight is yet another kind of obvious pick, and that is Japanese Breakfast with Jubilee. Uh, I definitely think this is the best thing Michelle has ever done. Just her transition into more uh, indie rock styles, into this very lush, ornate kind of art pop, I think was a very successful sort of risk she took here. And also, songwriting is really good, the singing is fantastic too. Uh, production is top-notch. It does so much in just under 40 minutes, and yet it still feels very cohesive and well put together. So yeah, great owl. Um, number seven is one of the wildest and most out-there rock releases of the year, and that is Black Midi's Cavalcade. Uh, really such a progression from their debut in terms of it manages to somehow be even weirder and even more out there than their last project was, and they also bring in a bit of prog and jazz into their sound, which I think they do very well on here, but uh, I think there's also this even greater sense of focus on this record. Like, they definitely, it feels more like they had a plan for what they were doing, whereas their last record felt very loose and was basically built out of kind of crazy jam sessions the band broke out into. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they, they really made something very uh, beautiful and adventurous on this thing, and I can't wait to see where they go f from here. Um, number six is a record that absolutely shook me to my core this year, and that is Backwash's I Lie Here Buried With My Rings and My Dresses. Uh, really, she takes what made her last album so great and basically dials it up to 11 with bigger volume, more heavy metal guitars, even more dark and disturbing lyrics this time around, and Backwash's raps just are so in your face and so just bloodthirsty. It's insane. Uh, like this record, it definitely has been really exciting to see Backwash's growth over the last couple of records, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing her next record, which uh, apparently, if he's
current she's been working on a little bit lately. So I don't know how she'll top this one, but come 2022, we're going to have to see. Number five is probably the most obvious pick of my list, and it easily is my pop record of the year, and that is An Evening with Silk Sonic. Uh, but come on, this uh, retro soul funk throwback panned out uh, way better than I would have ever expected. Bruno and Anderson just have great chemistry with one another on this thing. The choruses are godlike, the production is beautiful, the energy is there, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. It's a short record, doesn't overstay its welcome, and really there's not much else I could ask for out of uh, this project. It is really something special for sure. Number four is my favorite singer-songwriter record of the year, and that is Lucy Dacus with Home Video. This album, I don't revisit it super often because it is a heavy album in, in how it sort of dives into past trauma as well as experiences from Lucy's childhood and teens and uh, how she was raised on Christian youth culture, hence VBS and cuts like that. Um, and it's such an emotionally cutting record to listen to as well, uh, but the writing on this thing is incredible. Uh, Lucy's vocals, I think, are very engaging throughout this thing. And this album also contains some of her most creative instrumentals yet. Like, the way that she blends indie rock instrumentation with more synthetic elements. She manages to make it sound just like the kind of blue video screen on the album cover. And uh, I definitely think she's made such a big achievement with this thing, and uh, it totally deserves all the acclaim it's gotten this year. Fantastic. Um, number three is my favorite hip-hop record of the year, which is JPEG Mafia with LP. Like, easily some of his most creative and imaginative uh, production ideas yet. Like, he really... I think made his best record and I think he's only gotten better as a rapper and as a writer as well on this thing. Uh, and yes, I do prefer the offline over the online version because this album just wouldn't be complete without Hazard Duty Pay. That song is a banger and uh, i just really curious to see where Peggy goes next because really you never know where he's going to go. And, that's what I absolutely love about him. So yes, hell, so yes. LP, JPEG Mafia, hell yeah. <laughs> Number two is probably my favorite chamber pop record of the 2020s. Uh, these, and uh, it's one that kind of came out of nowhere for me, but really ended up being uh, one of my favorite albums of the year. And that is Sloppy Jane with Madison. Uh, this record is just, uh, the attention to detail on this thing is incredible, and there's all kinds of really insane things that Haley Dahl and company do on this thing, like recording it in a cave, for one, and also uh, coming through with just some very beautiful spellbinding arrangements on this thing, uh, and it's also just an incredibly twisted and kind of out there record too. Uh, the lyrics can get really disturbing and even kind of gruesome sometimes. Uh, and uh, I love all the little motifs that occur throughout the record and give it sort of a uh, reoccurring theme that I really dig. Uh, Haley Dahl, kind of like with Lingua Ignota, also showcases a wide vocal and writing uh, ability range on this record. Uh, I really like the flow of the record as well. Uh, it really feels like a full experience uh, in a way, and uh, it's definitely quite a big achievement for sure, and really one of the most unique albums that 2021 has had to offer. So yes, this is a, just an amazing, amazing record. Um, now for my number one album, which I'm going to go ahead and say it, 
I think this album may be the future of rock music, in my opinion. And that is Turnstiles Glow On. This album is just banger after banger after banger, uh, and I think what this band came through with was an album that is one that you could either bang your head to or vibe out to, just the way that they blend this heavy, hardcore sound with uh, some of the best melodies and hooks I've heard in rock music in recent times uh, is just really, it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous how they make that work. Uh, I think Mike Elizondo did a good job helping the band uh, kind of polish up their sound, but still uh, feeling very unique, uh, and the attention to detail is impeccable on, on this thing as well. Uh, it's got great passion and energy to it as well. Uh, it's one of those rare rock albums that just focuses on just having fun. And, uh, either having fun in the studio or just writing really kick-ass uh, pop rock songs, uh, in songs. And I think it is great that this album has been getting as much acclaim as it has and that it's not just me singing its praises because because uh, Turnstile really made uh, their magnum opus and an album that I could see even influencing other artists in this lane. Like, I, I could see uh, them sort of creating a blueprint for what the hardcore punk scene or basically just underground rock music in general is going to look like. So yes, uh, Turnstile made a masterpiece and I, it's, and uh, I couldn't have been happier that uh, they made this evolution here. So yeah, those are my top 50 albums of 2021. I really thought this was an amazing year for music. Feel free to share with me some of your favorite records of the year. I'd be curious to hear what they are as well. And uh, I'm excited to see what 2022 has to offer because I think... Uh, this year has definitely shown a lot of uh, great stuff, and uh, I could see it. Uh, I could see the drop of music getting better uh, in the future. So, this is Joshua Kirk signing off.